Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Peter. I'm going to be telling you about some of the new uh, solutions uh, that are in the pipeline for mitigating uh, ruminant methane. So we're looking at uh, reducing absolute amounts of methane emitted. Uh, the uh, topics that I'm talking about are actually come from a very wide range of people, um, more cleverer than I am and uh, know a lot more about it. And I'm going to try and cover the whole area, but I'm not an expert in every area. So when it comes to questions later, I might have to throw to some people in the audience for a bit of help on that. So, uh, good. So first of all, uh, we'll talk about where this methane comes from. Um, it comes from the rumen, which is a modified foregut of um, ruminant animals. And it's basically a large fermentation vat. And in that fermentation vat, the feed that the animal uh, eats is digested because the, uh, the advantage of that for the animal is that it's able to uh, consume and live off uh, feeds that uh, mammals normally can't grow on. So uh, inside this rumen, there's a diverse uh, combination of microorganisms, a community of bacteria and uh, protozoa, fungi, and also uh, some organisms called methanogens, uh, which produce the methane. So the uh, microbes ferment the feed. They produce uh, volatile fatty acids, which are um, absorbed by the animal and are used for the animal for energy and for uh, growth and so on. Um, and uh, the hydrogen is a waste product and it's metabolized by a group of organisms called methanogens, so methanogen generators that uh, produce the methane. So if we look at the types of uh, inhibition that, or the types of mitigation that we might want to look at, so these are ones that we're investigating. I'm not talking about every type of mitigation that's out there, but these are ones that are being investigated because they are potentially practical for farms on New Zealand. They may be additive, some of them may never work, but uh, there's a suite of mitigations to try and uh, come up with technologies that will be available for farmers. So uh, we have feeds which uh, result in uh, less methane uh, formed per um, amount of feed eaten. And these usually work by modifying the way that the feed is fermented so that there's less hydrogen formed and therefore you get less methane. You can select for animals that uh, naturally produce uh, less methane. Um, there's usually some, well, we think there will be, and in the case of sheep we know, for dairy we don't, or cattle we don't yet know exactly. There's a modification to the animal that changes the way the feed is fermented, and that change results in less hydrogen being formed and therefore less methane. And then there are uh, ways of actually targeting the microbes that produce the methane, the methanogens, using vaccines and inhibitors. So I'll quickly run through uh, some of those. I'm going to be very fast and there's a lot of words on these slides um, because if there were pictures I'd ramble on about all sorts of other stuff. So, so um, feeds, um, it's been said before, the biggest driver of the amount of methane uh, formed is the amount that the animal eats. Uh, there's a pretty strong relationship, in, uh, term, especially in terms of ryegrass um, or pasture and changes in the forage quality don't have a very large impact at all on that. So there's not a lot of room to move there. Um, we know that grains uh, result in less methane. Um, that actually is again by a similar mechanism that results in less hydrogen being formed. Um, but you have to have quite a high level of inclusion in the diet for it to sort of break through and have an effect. Um, most of the other feeds that we've looked at or people have looked at uh, in various programs have uh, shown that the methane yields from those are similar to pasture. So switching to those doesn't result in an absolute reduction of methane per unit of uh, feed consumed. One of the uh, feeds that does is forage rape. Um, it reduces uh, methane by about 25 to 35% compared to a ryegrass and um, for about the same amount of animal performance. That's a very important consideration, of course. Um, other brassicas also reduce methane. Uh, they've been less intensively investigated. So that looks promising. Um, of course, you know, everyone's not going to plough everything up and suddenly grow brassicas everywhere. That's not going to happen. So the overall impact will be small. And there's a consideration there about a trade-off with increased nitrous oxides because of the way that these are fed, uh, especially when they're fed in situ. So um, that's been looked at. There's only very, very early evidence on that suggests that the nitrous oxide emissions don't eat up all of the methane saving, which is good, but as I said, very early, it's actually just one set of experiments under one set of conditions. So still quite a lot of work to do there. 
And um, the other thing is fodder beet. Uh, fodder beet um, also can reduce uh, methane emissions, um, but again, it's a bit like grain. You have to push through a um, quite a high level of inclusion before you start to see an impact. And we all know that um, fodder beet at high levels of inclusion can have other problems. So there's, there's some overall some promise in feeds, but overall feeds uh, are not going to make a big difference uh, unless people completely change their farming systems. There is another feed, people will have heard about this on the news, um, HME ryegrass, high metabolizable energy ryegrass, which is a genetically modified plant that in, um, accumulates levels of oils and oil globules inside the leaves at about twice the level um, of a normal um, ryegrass. And to date, that shows some promise that it may have an impact, but we'll tell you what that promise is. It's glass bottle experiments, so they don't always extrapolate to real life. And uh, the effects on uh, nitrogen are all by modeling. So that's, again, not real life. So this still has a long way to go. The people running this program have a very ambitious uh, timeline. They're looking at, um, they're in field trials at the moment. They're trying to introduce that trait into elite ryegrass uh, cultivars or breeding lines. Um, want to do some feeding trials in animals in 2021, and I think that'll be the key. We'll be able to see whether this has got any legs or not. Um, and then the idea is to uh, push that forward into uh, um, trials potentially in New Zealand. There are some hurdles, as we all know, about uh, the use of uh, GMOs in New Zealand. Um, and so this, again, it has promise, but um, there are also some, um, some considerations about how, if it's going to work and whether it's going to be available uh, under the current sort of climate for um, use of GMOs. Oops, sorry. Um, breeding low methane sheep is uh, something that uh, could work. We know that, um, or does work actually, we know that um, you can breed for low methane sheep. Ag Research has a flock of low methane sheep. Um, showing that uh, it's heritable. Uh, the heritability is similar to other production traits, so it should fit in very well into uh, New Zealand um, farming systems, and farmers should be able to select for it like they select for any other trait. Obviously, when they're selecting for methane, they're not selecting for something else, but that's as with any trait that you're selecting for. Those sheep uh, don't seem to have any uh, production downsides from what we've seen to date, which is important. Um, it will require some type of infrastructure and industry support to actually get that out there onto farms. And uh, those, um, the low methane trait in sheep will be available to um, a pilot group of ram breeders later this year. So, you know, and it, it's possible that that could be on farm in a few years' time. There's still quite a lot of actual other considerations there as well. How far can you push this? We've only got about a 6% difference to the average. Can that be pushed further? These are all questions we don't know yet. Can it go to 10 or 15% below the average? We don't know. Well, two minutes, gosh, I better get moving. <laughs> um, okay, another option we have is breeding uh, low methane cattle. Um, this is uh, based on the fact that the um, sheep uh, research looks promising. The, uh, an industry group has been formed to, uh, to start this breeding. Um, or at least assess the potential for breeding, so infrastructure is being brought in, and similar to the sheep that can be um, introduced into the national herd. Uh, we don't know where the final limit is, and require, again, infrastructure to prove, how for, um, prove that it's disseminating into the industry. Uh, we have uh, an inhibitor um, program, which has been funded by the PGGRC. Uh, a couple of years ago, we announced that there were a number of potential inhibitors that could be used. Um, or had promise for, for use on farm. Uh, we've been concentrating on one particular inhibitor uh, that is being um, trialled at the moment for release in a slow-release intraruminal device. Uh, and um, we're looking at uh, improving that to increase the longevity of the capsule and lower the dose. Um, looking then <coughs> at, we're actually very soon going to start some very first production trials and we're looking at things like persistence and safety, effects on animal product quality and so on. These all need to come, and this is going to take some time, probably seven or more years, to get this uh, onto the farm. And we're also looking at uh, second generation and backup options as well. Um, you will have heard about uh, DSMs 3 and OP. Uh, 
we've been working with uh, DSM to look at their inhibitor, which um, has been proved to be very effective in a feedlot system. Uh, we've shown that it does work on uh, forage-fed animals. Um, the trick is to try and get it into a system that works in New Zealand, and we're looking at um, help. We're working with them to develop their extended release formats so that uh, the animals, when they consume it, say in a dairy shed or on a feed pad or something like that, and then they go back to pasture, that that material, the 3NOP inhibitor, is still active at the time when the animals are grazing pasture again. There's a couple of posters about that on the, um, on the poster boards outside. And then the last um, thing that I want to talk about is the anti-methane vaccine, which was talked about a little bit earlier today. So the idea is to stimulate the animal's immune response so that antibodies targeting the methane-producing microbes hit the uh, rumen or go into the rumen and interfere with the activity of those methanogens producing the methane. Um, this is potentially very easily integrated into uh, New Zealand farming systems. So we've sort of got all the pieces there. We show you can get antibodies, they go into the rumen, they survive in the rumen. Um, you can make synthetic antigens, so that's the bit that stimulates the immune system and they still recognise the native um, methanogens uh, or the targets on the methanogens. So it's just at the moment it doesn't actually work in the animal. We don't get a methane reduction. So our current efforts are on trying to understand why that is and then uh, to overcome that particular hurdle. And then that will also take time as all the production and regulatory steps to get that onto the market. So um, there's obviously a huge amount of information. There's uh, eight programs with 15 or 20 years worth of work behind them each. An enormous number of people have um, worked on that. So I'd like to acknowledge all their efforts. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, so for the remainder of the talk, I'll just take you through very quickly some of the um, potential um, technologies for reducing nitrous oxide from agricultural soils. So if you look at the sources of nitrous oxide in the, um, uh, from the soil, you see that um, most of the nitrous oxide is actually coming from the animal excreta urine and dung in particular. And that is followed by uh, the nitrous oxide from the nitrogen fertilizers. So these are the key uh, sources for nitrous oxide from the soil. And if you look at the uh, processes that produce nitrous oxide using urine as an example, you see that as the uh, grazing animal grazes the pasture, for example, dairy cow, about 80% of the nitrogen ingested by the grazing animal is returned to the soil in the rear end, in the urine and dung, particularly the urine. So the nitrogen loading rate uh, under a urine pad for the dairy cow, for example, can be somewhere between about 700 kg per hectare to 1,000 kilograms per hectare, so under a single urine patch in a single urination. So as the nitrogen gets into the soil, it's releasing ammonium, which then undergoes a nitrification process so nitrification produces nitrous oxide as a byproduct. And then nitrate, which is produced from the nitrification, can either be leached into the surface water or groundwater, or it may undergo denitrification, which also produces nitrous oxide. So two major processes that produce nitrous oxide. The main problem with the urine uh, patch of nitrogen is the high loading rate, you know, over 700 kg per hectare, that's well above that which can be utilized by the plant. So is there anything we can do to reduce the nitrogen loading rate in the urine patch then? Well, one of the options is include some other uh, pasture species, like uh, plantain, for example. Okay, so if you include plantain in a diverse patch, pasture, including ryegrass, white clover, you could reduce the nitrogen concentration in the urine and therefore the nitrogen loading rate on the urine patch. Okay, so here you can see as the plantain um, component increases from zero to 50 to 100 percent, the nitrogen concentration in the urine decreases and the nitrogen loading rate decreases as well accordingly. So there's uh, some autumn data and some spring data. So what happens to the nitrous oxide emissions then if you reduce the 
nitrogen loading rate under the urine patch. So here's some work showing that if you reduce the nitrogen loading rate from 700 kilograms in hectare in a typical ryegrass wet clover pasture down to about 500 kilograms in hectare in a, in a plantain can, containing diverse pasture, you can see that total nitrous oxide emissions are reduced and the emission factors are also reduced. So you certainly can reduce the nitrous oxide emissions by reducing the nitrogen loading rate by including plantain as, a, as part of the pasture. There's a, as, as I said, there's a considerable variability in the amount of nitrogen and a urine patch. Here's some work from Cecile Decline in uh, South Otago showing the nitrogen loading rate changes from um, plant uh, ryegrass white clover pasture at 1,000 kilograms in hectare down to gradually to 560 as the plantain content increased from 0 to 15% to 30% to 45%. What you can see here is that there seems to be a critical uh, threshold for the nitrous oxide reductions to be significant. Um, so if the plantain component is greater than 30%, you can see the reductions are significant compared to the uh, ryegrass white clover pasture. But if it's less than 30%, then the reductions may not be significant. So there's some, um, uh, you need to reach a critical value for the plantain to, uh, effect to be significant. Uh, so there's some variability in terms of the, um, uh, the comparison between the plantain pasture versus the ryegrass wet clover pasture, particularly in terms of the, the plant effect. For example, does the plant, plantain, actually release some biological nitrification inhibitors in the soil, which has reduced nitrous oxide. And that is something that will require some further research to understand the uh, soil, the environmental factors, and some of the mechanisms involved. So what are the uh, technologies? One of the ways you can reduce nitrous oxide and also nitrate leaching is by using a nitrification inhibitor to treat the soil. So if you did that, you can reduce the first step of the nitrification process, and that is the ammonia oxidation process. So by doing so, you can reduce the nitrification rate and therefore reduce nitrous oxide from the nitrification process. You reduce the nitrate concentration in the soil and therefore reduce the nitrous oxide from the denitrification process. So a lot of research has been done uh, across New Zealand over a number of years looking at the effect of DCD, for example, in reducing nitrous oxide emissions and nitrate leaching. And here you can see there is a significant reduction in nitrous oxide from a urine patch, or, um, and also here, reductions in the nitrate leaching uh, by using the nitrification inhibitor. So nitrate leaching reduction, of course, has implications for water quality as well. And of course, it's also an indirect source for nitrous oxide. But of course, DCD, as you know, is not used currently in New Zealand because there is no food standard for it. So the FAO Codex Committee, which is responsible for developing food standards, are in fact developing uh, standards for a category of compounds which are so-called non-toxic or very low in toxicity. And this report apparently is coming out around the middle of this year. So my question is that, you know, will DCD come back when there is a food standard for not only DCD, but a whole lot of other uh, chemicals that are used in the agricultural sector? That, I guess, is a, a question for government and industry to make. It is possible that um, it may come back to some sectors, but not to all sectors, depending on their sensitivity to trade and so on. But it is used in many other countries around the world as a mitigation, environmental mitigation technology. Well, if it doesn't come back, there is research that has been going on over the past three to four years in trying to discover new nitrification inhibitors. And this has been funded by MPI under the Global Research Alliance um, scheme. So good progress has been made. And if all goes well, you may well see a new inhibitor either in addition to DCD or in place of DCD in the next three to five years. Looking at reduction options for um, nitrous oxide from the urea fertilizer, 
Well, you can use a uh, urea inhibitor coated fertilizer to reduce the uh, volatilization, which is an indirect source for nitrous oxide. You can use a nitrification inhibitor coated uh, um, urea fertilizer to reduce both the um, direct N2 emissions and nitrate leaching, which is an indirect source for nitrous oxide. And of course, you can use both the urease and the nitrification inhibitor coated fertilizer to reduce all three sources, volatilize, uh, volatilization, direct N2 emissions, and also nitrate leaching. So if you used this last fertilizer, you could potentially reduce greenhouse gas emissions from your urea fertilizer by between about 40 to 50%, so substantial reductions there. So that's a very quick rundown of some of the potential technologies which are either available or could be available uh, sometime down the track. Thank you.